Please open your Bibles to 2 John. 2 John, just a little bitty book, a couple of pages before the book of Revelation, only has one chapter, 2 John. That's where we'll be for the majority of our lesson. We'll leave it a few times, but we'll return to it. Appreciate so much the song selection. Kyle does a great job picking out some songs and led some that we knew very well this morning. The singing was beautiful. Things like that are what makes Sundays the best day of the week. We get to break open the Word of God. We get to partake of the Lord's Supper. We get to hear prayers made on our behalf before the throne of glory. And it truly, truly, truly sets the week apart, doesn't it? It sets the day apart from the rest of the week. I appreciate so much each and every one of you being here. Russ is out of town this week. He's in a meeting in Florida, so pray for him. And, and uh, he did make a comment last week I felt like I should address. So I was out of town last Sunday for reasons that are none of your business. And, and uh, it was a honeymoon. And Russ made the comment that, that at the wedding the Saturday before, that Meredith was crying uncontrollably, and I was smiling like a fool. That's not fair. I'm always smiling like a fool. And she was crying uncontrollably, but her words were, all of my wildest dreams have come true. <laughs> so, felt like I should address that uh, before we move on. The elders have asked me to preach a lesson on membership. And so next Sunday morning... We're going to address this topic. It will benefit you to be here. This is a, a, an important subject. I appreciate their desire for it to be preached on. It is important, guys. It really is important. So be here. Be here next Sunday morning. That's when we'll address that topic. And my clicker that I did not check is... Ah, that's, it did come on, finally. There we go. We're continuing a series through the epistles of John and Jude. I feel like I'm preaching the same lesson over and over and over again. But I think in some ways that, that itself is a benefit. I want us to begin in 2 John, please. 2 John, look at verses 9 and following. 2 John, verse 9. John writes, Whoever transgresses and does not abide in the doctrine of Christ does not have God. He who abides in the doctrine of Christ has both the Father and the Son. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this doctrine, do not receive him into your house nor greet him. For he who greets him shares in his evil deeds. In some ways, we get verse 9. The importance of the doctrine of Jesus Christ. But in the same breath of air, we don't get verse 10 because this is just removed from our culture. It's removed from our day and age. But, but I want you to appreciate. Let's just kind of step into a time machine here and go back even 150 years. There's a good pioneer preacher, uh, J.D. Tant. There's a book about him, The Texas Preacher, and I have it on my shelf in my office. He's a gospel preacher. He was raised and ended up being ordained as a Methodist preacher, a, a circuit preacher is what they called him, at 18 or 19 years old, and he began preaching for the Methodist denomination. And then he was confronted with a Campbellite. Okay, this is going back in the history books, isn't it? He was confronted by a Campbellite, and he liked some of the simplicity in his teaching. And at about 19 years old, he obeyed the gospel, left the Methodist denomination, and began to preach the simple New Testament gospel of Jesus Christ. He preached all over the United States. And folks, this is back in the horse and buggy days. And so he would go and preach a two-week or a three-week long meeting somewhere. And he would go all over Texas, all over Oklahoma, Arkansas, and he actually, he was at one point asked to do 390 meetings one year. Obviously he couldn't do 390 meetings because that was back in the 10-day meetings and the two-week meetings and the three-week meeting days. But, but here's what I want you to appreciate. We are not that far removed, folks, from an era of the teaching of Jesus Christ 
where it was going about in all directions and you did not have Google to double check things that are being said. You, you couldn't pull up a YouTube page and find out what this man was saying week to week to week to week to week. You had to know the individual or you had to really listen to what he was saying to see if it matched up with the teaching of Jesus Christ, the teaching of the New Testament apostles. We're not that far removed from that, folks. And yet this message is still so relevant today. The simple doctrine of Jesus Christ. What the book teaches and making sure that we're sticking to it. I think in some ways the relevancy of this message has lost none of its potency. I'm probably not that much different than you. I pull up my Facebook or I pull up YouTube and I am inundated with these great theologians of the internet and these little one minute clips where they're explaining some passage of scripture or they're telling some great thing or they're making one really quotable statement. And, and so we're surrounded by this teaching in some ways more than we ever have been. And what we need to do then is have a careful mind. We need to think through the things that we're being told and think through the things that we are hearing. And we are not immune to this, this careful, inspective mentality. Even, in some cases, by people who claim to be preachers for a church of Christ. I, I say air quotes because that's a little denominational sounding. But guys, there are people all the time who are saying things and doing things that are not consistent with the doctrine of Jesus Christ. Sometimes a preacher will even get off base on one topic or another. Grace, works, faith, Holy Spirit stuff. And so what we need to do is take the message of John, the message that was to the first century audience, and we need to apply it in the 21st century world where we are careful about what we are hearing. We're making sure that what we hear lines up with this book. I've started trying to brainwash my children. I say that tongue-in-cheek. Check the Bible. And if what we're hearing, what we're being told, what we're studying... I use that phrase loosely, doesn't match the Bible, then we need to dismiss it, folks. If it can't be proven from the text, we need to dismiss it. That message is 2,000 years old, folks, and still just as relevant for our world today. So, I'm going to preach a very simple lesson, I hope, this morning. Oftentimes we, we get a little complicated, and sometimes we need to be complicated, but I want to do something very, very simple this morning. Three points that I hope you'll be able to appreciate from this text that will help you better appreciate the doctrine of Jesus Christ. <clears throat> Number one, what you need to do is know the truth. Look at this text. Let's go ahead and read it. You didn't think, well, we're going to read an entire book of the Bible this morning. Everybody ready? It's 13 verses, okay? It makes some people panic, okay? Uh, we'll read Psalm this morning. All right, 2 John, look at verse 1. The elder to the elect lady and her children, whom I love in truth, and not only I, but also all those who have known the truth, because of the truth which abides in us and will be with us forever. Grace, mercy, and peace will be with you from God the Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of the Father, in truth and love. I rejoice greatly that I found some of your children walking in truth, as we have received commandment from the Father. And now I plead with you, lady, not as though I write or not as though I wrote a new commandment to you, but that which we have had from the beginning, that we love one another. And this is love, that we walk according to his commandments. This is the commandment, that as you have heard from the beginning, you should walk in it. For many deceivers have gone out into the world who do not confess Jesus Christ as coming in the flesh. This is a deceiver and an antichrist. Look to yourselves that we not lose those things we have worked for, but that we receive a full reward. Whoever transgresses and does not abide in the doctrine of Christ does not have God. He who abides in the doctrine of Christ has both the Father and the Son. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this doctrine, do not receive him into your house nor greet him, for he who greets him shares in his evil deeds. 
Having many things to write to you, I did not wish to do so with paper and ink, but I hope to come to you and speak face to face that our joy may be full. The children of your elect sister greet you. Amen. Notice verses 1 and 2. The emphasis on the truth. He says, To the elect lady and her children whom I love in truth. And not only I, but also those who have known the truth, because of the truth which abides in us and will be with us forever. Especially that phrase at the end of verse 1, have known the truth. Well, knowing the truth is a prerequisite for the other concepts of truth in this text. You have to know the truth. That's the only way you can love in truth, verse 1. That's the only way that the truth can abide in us and be with us forever is if you know the truth. But can I advocate an aspect of that that we often don't consider? Knowing the truth is not a past tense discussion. You understand what I mean by that? There's never a situation where you have known the truth. Now, there's a sense in which, if we're talking about a particular subject, you can know it past tense, and so maybe the subject would be baptism. Do you know that you need to be baptized for the mission of your sins? Did you obey that commandment? Well, that would be a past tense discussion then, wouldn't it? But if we're thinking about the totality of the doctrine of Jesus Christ, if we're thinking about the, the great simplicity of the New Testament message, folks, there's never a point where you've known it all. There's never a point where you've got it. You've got it all figured out. See, this is a process. It is a lifetime of devotion to the truth. It is a lifetime committed to growing and doing better and getting further into the book and into the message. There was a great cellist, a Spanish man by the name of Pablo Casals, And there's some discussion about how old he was when this was stated. Either, either he was 67 or he was in his 90s. But there was an interviewer who asked him, said, why are you practicing? I mean, he, he was world-renowned at this point. He says, why are you practicing? And his comment was, I think I'm getting better. Folks, we need to have that same mentality. Why do you keep studying? Why, why, you've given your life to this. Don't you kind of know most of it at this point? No, 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 no. I want to know more. I want to know more so that I'm better at this. I want to serve God better. I want to know Him more fully. And so what you do is you push yourself to know the truth, to know it better, to know it more fully, to know it and appreciate it more. I don't often share quotes this long, but I, I did this one, so I put it on the board. You can't read that. That's great. Okay. I can't read it, so I'll read it to you here. The Christian scriptures are so deep that even if I studied them to the exclusion of all else, from early childhood to worn out old age, with ample leisure and untiring zeal, and with greater capacity of mind than I possess, each day I would still discover new riches within them. Do you appreciate what he said? He said, if I quit reading anything else and just looked at this with more information and knowledge than I accurately possess now, I would still discover new treasures in this material. He goes on to say the fundamental truths necessary for salvation are found with ease in the Scriptures. But even when a person has accepted these truths and is both God-fearing and righteous in his actions, there are still so many things which lie under a vast veil of mystery. Through reading the Scriptures, we can pierce this veil and find the deepest wisdom in the words which express these mysteries. And in the end of each day, I have finished and yet my studies have only just begun. I got to admit, folks, I like that quote. That was Augustine of Hippo some 1,600 years ago. Do you approach Bible study that way? Oh, I know a lot, but I've just scratched the surface, and I want to know more. Is there that, that hunger, that innate desire to just know more? Far too often, folks, we stop before we even have the books of the Bible memorized. I've told this joke before. It's not very funny. When I started preaching, you could have told me, turn to the book of Hezekiah, and I would have started looking through the Old Testament. 
Thankfully, I have progressed a little. I know now Hezekiah didn't write a book. But folks, do you just get to a point where you just stop? Surely not. Uh, Look at Hebrews 5. Hebrews, the fifth chapter. We're going to plug a couple of other verses in here, I think, that are really helpful for this topic. Look at Hebrews 5. This is a text we know very well, especially in this subject matter. Hebrews 5. Hebrews, the fifth chapter. The Hebrew writer has spent the last several chapters essentially saying, there's a big subject I'm wanting to talk to you about. There's a big subject I'm wanting to talk to you about. And he finally lays it on the line in verse 11. He says, I've got a lot more to say to you. They're hard to explain things, especially since you've become dull of hearing. Look at verse 12. For though by this time you ought to be teachers... You need someone to teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God. You've come to need milk and not solid food. For everyone who partakes only of milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But solid food belongs to those who are of full age, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Therefore, leaving the discussion of the elementary principles of Christ, let us go on to perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God, doctrines of baptisms, of laying on of hands, of resurrection of the dead and of eternal judgment. Folks, you appreciate what he's saying? There are some topics that that you should have a good, solid grasp on that you shouldn't have to have it beat back into you every time you turn around. And that certainly is not to say that we never return to old subjects. Even in class Wednesday night, I made this point. I think it's a valid point that needs to be made. If we do not talk about some of the old subjects then we'll raise a generation that doesn't know those subjects. And it could be anything. We're not going to talk about baptism for the remission of sins. Does everybody in here know that? You need to be baptized for the remission of your sins. That's what the book teaches? Sure. Everybody got that. But if we don't talk about it, there'll be a generation that is raised that doesn't know about it. And that subject is bigger than that. It could go into instrumental music. It could go into the work and authority of the local church and how the church uses its money and what we do with with this congregation in our worship. Guys, if we don't talk about those things, a generation will be raised among us that doesn't know those things. But that's not what he's talking about here. He's talking about people who should be able to teach those subjects. But instead of being able to teach those subjects, they're having to sit at the feet of somebody else who's teaching them again. Could you take somebody right now and show them from the New Testament that they need to be baptized for remission of their sins? Could you show somebody that? If you can't, why can't you? Can you, oh, you're going to like this one. Can you show someone the passage that says we can't use instrumental music in New Testament worship? I said air quotes because that that verse doesn't exist. But we have no authority to use instrumental music in New Testament worship. We talked about that a little Wednesday night, didn't we? Can you show somebody? Can you take somebody and walk them through what it means to become a New Testament Christian, what it means to be holy, what it means to walk in the truth? If you can't, why can't you? You see, at some point, folks, you go from learning a little bit of the truth to sharing the truth, to teaching the truth. You hunger and thirst for the truth. As a newborn babe hungers and thirsts for the milk, Peter says in 1 Peter 2. That's what you should be doing. Starving for more. Andrew in the talk Wednesday night made this point, didn't he? I believe the illustration he gave was he shows up at home from work and he's hungry and he wants to eat. That's all he can think about. Guys, do we approach the spiritual food like that? Do we hunger for what this book holds? Do we desperately, desperately search for it, wanting to know more? You shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. The truth is where freedom is found. And folks, you think about what that means. 
It's only by learning truth. Learning what this book holds that you learn about sin, isn't it? It's only by obeying the truth that you are freed from sin. You see how all of this connects to the truth? Uh, Look at Ephesians 4. Ephesians, the fourth chapter. We spent a little time referring back to this verse recently in our Ephesians class. Notice this phrase, Ephesians 4. Ephesians 4, he's making this argument, beginning back up even in verse 7, about what this, these, especially these offices of verse 11 are supposed to do. And they're building, they're maturing, they're developing the people. Look at verse 14. Here's what you want. That we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men in which the cunning, cra- or excuse me, in the cunning craftiness by which they lie in wait to deceive. You see, that's what happens when you don't know the truth, when you don't develop and you don't mature and you don't grow up. You are easily duped, fooled into something you should not be involved in. Folks, we've got to grow up beyond the age, the level, the maturity of a child. But here's a part of that. There are some topics you could be very mature on. You've got a good handle on, good grasp for them. But then there could be other topics where you're still a little bit of a child on it. You don't have a good handle on it. You're not grown up on it. You're not mature on it. And so maybe there's different areas, different categories where you've got to work on those things. You've got to grow up. You've got to mature. You've got to develop. Know the truth. I think this is really important in our culture today. The truth is not a subjective experience where it's different for everyone. The truth is objective. It is absolute. It is unchallenged. It's not left to perspective. It's not left to perception. Truth is absolute. Meaning 2 plus 2 is 4. Whether you think it is or not. That's how it is. That's how the truth works. And it's sad that even in our culture where this subject is so heavily discussed and debated, even some of the world are beginning to see this. Oprah, you never thought I'd quote her in the pulpit, did you? Oprah was really, really big on this speak your truth craze. Live your truth craze. Do you guys see the innate problem with concepts like that? There's the truth. Or there is not truth. Your truth, and I understand the point. Speak your perspective, speak your perception. I I, I get that. But that does not mean what you're saying is the truth. In fact, there was even an article in Atlantic Magazine that was criticizing that mantra-like statement. Because even of the world, they get this. It's not your truth. It's not my truth. It is the truth. Now, you may think, I I don't see a, I I see the point. I see part of the problem here. But guys, what what we need to appreciate is, is if we start doing things like this, what we do is we make the truth some sort of subjective thing where parts of it apply to me and parts of it don't. You see that danger? We start saying, yes, you need to be baptized for mission of your sins. That's what that book objectively says. But then we go to passages like, Matthew 19, with marriage, divorce, and remarriage, and we say, but not that one. Folks, we've got to know the truth. Number two, back in 2 John, please. I told you this was going to be simple. You've got to live the truth. Look at 2 John again. 2 John, look at verse 4. He says, I greatly rejoiced that I found some of your children walking in truth as we have received commandment from the Father. And now I plead with you, lady, not as though I wrote a new commandment to you, but that which, uh, that which we have had from the beginning, that we love one another. And this is love, that we walk according to His commandments. This is the commandment that as you have heard from the beginning, you should walk in it. Especially notice verse 4 and 6. 
He says in verse 4, you have children walking in truth. In verse 6, he says that we walk according to the commandments. And then he says at the very end, you should walk in it. Now, now we already know the term walk, biblically language, that, that's talking about living a certain way, that we live according to the truth. We live according to the teachings of Jesus Christ. But I want to tell you something, folks. The gospel is more than having the right doctrine. The gospel is more than having the right doctrine. Do not misunderstand me and think he's saying doctrine doesn't matter. No, sir, that is not what I'm saying. But the gospel is more than that. Because what the gospel wants is not just you to do the right thing. It wants you to love the right thing. It, God wants your mind. God wants your heart. God wants your obedience. But he wants all of that. So it's not just living right, verse 4. Look at verse 6. This is love that we walk according to his commandments. You see it? It's not just that you live the right thing, it's that you love the right thing. You love the things of God. You see, what you do matters, but why you do what you do matters just as much. Can I illustrate that point? Your children are expected to obey you, correct? Now, Children understand, I'm talking children, let's say teenagers. Teenagers understand fornication, sex before marriage, is wrong. See, we know what's right. Now, why wouldn't you participate, though? If you're afraid mom and dad are going to catch you, that is not the right answer. If you're afraid of disappointing mom and dad, that's really not the right answer. You see, you see my point now? You can do what's right, but do it for the wrong reasons. Oh, maybe, maybe make it a little more personal. You know, adultery is a sin. Now, why don't you commit adultery? Well, I'm afraid my spouse would catch me. Mmm, do not tell your spouse that. Because that's not the answer they want. Well, I'm loyal to my spouse because I love them. Yeah, there we go. You see, what you do matters, but why you do what you do matters just as much. We wouldn't want anything less from our own children, would we? Why don't you slip a little money out of your dad's wallet? Oh, I'm afraid he'll catch me. I'm going to tell you, if one of my kids told me that's the reason they don't steal from me, it would break my heart. So why don't they do bad? Well, it's because they love me. Guys, it is no different with God. He doesn't want you to just do what's right. He wants you to love what's right. He wants you to love Him who is behind all things that are right. Th this is not just about blind obedience, folks. This is actually where you get into the discussion of legalism. You do what's right and how you feel about it doesn't matter. No, sir, that is legalistic. But we're not looking for box checking. We're looking for devotion and passion for God and passion for what's right. Deuteronomy 6. I want you to notice a part of this text, Deuteronomy, the sixth chapter. And appreciate not just what this text says, but the history of this text. This is one of the greatest passages in the Jewish faith. In Deuteronomy 6, Deuteronomy 6, look at verse 4. Because this really encapsulates this. God hasn't shifted his viewpoint He's not changed his rules. He still wants the same thing. Look at verse 4. Deuteronomy 6, verse 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall, here it is, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. These words which I command you today shall be in your heart. What is he talking about? Loving what God tells you to do. They shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children. You shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, when you rise up. You shall bind them as a sign on your hands, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gates. What's he talking about? Be obedient. You do what God tells you to do, but what is an intrinsic part of that? You do what God told you to do because you love Him. Folks, Christianity is not just about strict rule-keeping. 
Christianity is about relationship with the Father God through Jesus Christ the Son. Relationship. Love and appreciation for who He is and what He's done for you. That's what Christianity is. This is why when Jesus was asked, what is the greatest commandment in the law? Remember what He said in Matthew 22? You love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength, and you love your neighbor as yourself. That's number two. They're together. Why is love so much a part of this? Because love is what's behind the rule keeping. It's not just checking the boxes. It's doing what God says to do because you love God. Living the truth is intrinsically connected to loving God. My friends, God does not want blind obedience from you. Can I say that again? God does not want blind obedience from you. He wants loving, sacrificial obedience from you. I I caught a comic the other day. It said blind obedience is closely akin to foolishness. And it was a guy standing in front of a sign and it said, watch, falling rocks. And he's looking up going, I see one. You see my point? Folks, God doesn't want you to just do what he says without really thinking about it, without having a passion for it, without loving him who is behind it. But there's no question there's a part of this that is challenging. You see, there's a whole other side of this this discussion where there are people who know what's right but do not do what's right. A couple of texts back in Matthew 7. This is where our scripture reading came from, was this context. Matthew, the 7th chapter. Brother Ed read verses 15 through 20. I want you to jump down to verse 24. There's a lot of people know what they should do, but do not do what they should do. Notice this phrase in verse 24. This is Jesus speaking at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 7, 24. Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine, notice this now, and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And of course, we know the rest of that passage, don't we? Wise man built his house upon the rock, and what happened? The flood come, wise man's house stood firm. I believe it's this. And what does the foolish man do? He hears the sayings, does not do them. When the floods come, uh, what is it? Splat. I had to think for a second. It's been a few months since VBS. Folks, why, why does that matter? Because God wants you to love him and do what he says. Even back up in verse 21, in this same context, all of our doing must be tempered by our knowing, by what we know about God and the word of God. Look at verse 21. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, done many wonderful works in your name? Then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. You see, the issue here is not that they were doing something. The issue is they were doing something ignorant of the truth. You see how all of this discussion kind of intermingles, goes together? God wants you to do what's right. He wants you to do what's right for the right reason. It's really important, folks. We need to live the truth. And of course, by loving the truth. Number three, we know the truth, we live the truth, and then number three, you thought I was going to do something with truth again, didn't you? Ha ha, caught you. We avoid the false. Look at verse 7. Verse 7 of Second John. For many deceivers have gone out into the world who do not confess Jesus Christ as coming in the flesh. This is a deceiver and an antichrist. Look to yourselves that we not lose those things we have worked for, but that we receive a full reward. Whoever transgresses and does not abide in the doctrine of Christ does not have God. He who abides in the doctrine of Christ has both the Father and the Son. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this doctrine, do not receive him into your house, nor greet him. For he who greets him shares in his evil deeds. 
Folks, sometimes it is not enough to know what's right. Sometimes we can identify what's wrong, and yet we still fall prey to what's wrong. You see, we've got to go one step further. There's a whole lot of people who desire to do what's right. They know what's right, but when it comes to the the nitty-gritty, they struggle to do it. I think part of this is why statements are made in the New Testament like Paul makes, flee sexual immorality in 1 Corinthians 6, 18. Folks, it's not just enough sometimes to avoid doing it. Sometimes you've got to distance yourself from it, get away from it, keep it at arm's length way over there. Reminds me of Joseph a little bit. Does it you? How did Joseph respond to Potiphar's wife? Well, you know, he kind of kept her around a little bit. It wasn't that big of a deal. No. He runs from her. Folks, that's how we have to look at sin. We don't, we don't dilly-dally in it. We don't play with it. We don't dabble in it. We run from it. There are a lot of good folks that have lost their souls even though they knew the truth and they were trying to live the truth and they were really faithful to King Jesus, but their, their downfall was that they didn't distance themselves from sin and things that advocate sin. And I don't know what your issue is. But I'm going to tell you something, folks. I read through a text like this and it challenges me to reconsider how comfortable I am around sin in this world. You guys that work, Out in the public sphere. You ever hear any vulgar jokes at the water cooler? Thankfully, I don't, but I share a water cooler with Russ. Lots of insults. Lots and lots of insults, but no vulgarity. Okay? Loving insults. Maybe I should say loving insults. But you guys that work out there, you hear vulgarity at the water cooler? What are you doing to distance yourself from things like that. You know, guys, we're surrounded by it in our world today, but maybe what we need to do instead of getting desensitized to it is distance ourselves from it. I'm reminded of a story. Horses generally don't like guns shot off of them. But I had a few horses I'd trained and worked with to do things like that. I knew of a particular group. When they broke these horses, they were immediately fine with loud noises. Crack a bullwhip around them, shoot guns around them, never bothered them. Come to find out, they were raised on a ranch next door to a a shooting range. And so what happened? All day, every day, they heard pop, pop. Pop, pop. People shooting guns in a shooting range. You know what happened to the horses? Those loud noises didn't bother them. Oh, plenty of other stuff bothered them. But loud noises like gunfire didn't bother them a bit. Folks, do you understand that that's exactly what we have done in our world today? We work in this world surrounded by sin. We hear all of this trash, this noise all the time, the garbage of society, the sin that is surrounding us, and we we don't even realize... We hear God's name taken in vain and we don't wince anymore. Folks, sometimes what we need to do, and we need to do it desperately, is distance ourselves from it. Maybe not go get a drink right now. When you know those guys are up there around it, they're going to say a nasty joke, they're going to say a few choice cuss words, maybe that's not when you should go get a drink, maybe you should wait a minute. Let the water cooler clear out a little. Maybe what we need to do is take drastic measures. We don't eat our lunch in the workroom anymore. I don't want to hear that nasty stuff. I don't want to be desensitized to it. Are you avoiding sin? Maybe even more importantly, are you avoiding those things that promote sin? Look at that verse again in verse 10. Look at verse 10 again. He says... If anyone comes to you and does not bring this doctrine, do not 
receive him into your house. Do not receive him into your house. He's not talking about sin itself. He's talking about those who are promoting it. Yet, folks, we do that with social media. We watch all of this stuff on YouTube and TikTok and Facebook. And the very things we're talking about here, people who are not teaching the truth, are giving you an earful right there on your little phone in your recliner. We're doing this. In some cases, not even realizing we're doing it. You want some practical points? The more times you click on that video on Facebook, the more times you're going to see content like it. You understand what I just said? You click on this guy preaching some sort of false doctrine, guess what? Next time you open Facebook, next time you open YouTube, the way that algorithm works, you're going to see more of it next time. Folks, maybe what you need to do is close the stuff down a little bit. Silence some of those things because those false teachers slowly erode your convictions on some cases, or in some cases, very basic truths. You need to be very, very careful. Look at verse 8. Look to yourselves. We have a great support system built into this congregation. We have elders who care about us, who want us to live faithfully to King Jesus. We have people who will wrap us in hugs and encouragement. They will help you stay the course, but it will not do you any good at all if when you leave here, you dive right back into the cesspool of society. you get constant admonitions from this pulpit. Russ will get up here and he will present things to help us. I get up here and present things to help us. But I'm going to tell you something, guys. It doesn't do you a lick of good if you're not going to go out there and apply it. It doesn't do me a lick of good. I mean, just if we want to get very, very personal here, I could get up here and preach my heart out on a subject, but if I don't walk out of here applying it, I'll go to hell just as fast as anybody. Can I, can I make it any plainer? Folks, you've you got to look out for yourselves here a little bit. Rely on this community, rely on this, this group of people, but lesson after lesson after lesson won't help you a bit if you won't listen to it. But if you will, if you will listen, if you will implement these very things, the last phrase of verse 8. He says that we receive a full reward. You want that? I know I do. Well, folks, this is a little bit of how you get it. There was a time in our culture where people would ride their horse from one city to the next, preaching the gospel. I was born in the wrong century, okay? I would much rather have useless, the three-legged horse, than you two. But I digress. There, there was a time, folks, where people had to be very, very careful about what they were listening to from every single source. Can I just advocate something? That time has not stopped yet you better be very careful about who and what you are listening to. Folks, half the New Testament is written about false teachers, written about people who are teaching things that will lead others away from the truth, written to Christians who need to be discerning and careful and diligent. And so it very much applies to us today. We need to be careful. 
If you want the full reward of Jesus Christ, this is in part how you get it. By knowing the truth, by living the truth, and by avoiding the things that will destroy that, the false. And it may be you have experienced these things, had these things before, and went back into the world. Now's your chance. Please don't let it pass. If we can help you or assist you in some way this morning, we'd ask you to make it known now as we stand and as we sing.